Hello, everybody. My name is Kyle Matthews. I'm executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. And we're very pleased today to bring together a distinguished panel of experts of various backgrounds and expertise to talk about Ethiopia and the response we protect, uh, to talk about the human security crisis taking place in Ethiopia's uh, Tigray region, which is increasingly being on the news agenda and have humanitarian actors and human rights activists calling for a stronger response. Um, Fighting between the Tigray People's Liberation Front and the federal government led by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed began on November 4th, 2021. Since then, the conflict has resulted in the displacement of 2 million people and has left 4 million people in desperate need of humanitarian aid. Eyewitnesses and journalists whose presence has been severely restricted in the Tigray region um, by the Ethiopian government have recounted countless atrocities, including killing of civilians, widespread sexual gender-based violence, destructions of schools and homes, fields and livestock and widespread hunger in a region already extremely vulnerable to famine. Over the next hour, we will hear from four experts on their perspectives on the conflict, International Obligations Act, and the role of journalists in covering this growing crisis. So I'd like to introduce our four distinguished speakers. First, we have Alan Rock, who's President Emeritus of the University of Ottawa and Professor at the Faculty of Law there. Uh, Alan teaches international humanitarian law and armed conflict and international law. Alan is also the former Canadian Minister of Justice, the former uh, Attorney General of Canada, and the former Canadian Ambassador to the UN when the response to protect was endorsed in 2005. Followed by Alan, we have Mukesh Kapila, who's a Professor Emeritus of Global Health and Humanitarian Affairs at the University of Manchester, where he also founded and chaired the Manchester Global Foundation. Mukesh served as a Special Advisor to the UN Special Representatives of the Secretary General in Afghanistan, and then to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. He then became the United Nations resident and humanitarian coordinator for Sudan from 2003 to 2004, leading what was at the time the UN's biggest operation in the world. We also are joined today with Nema El Bagir. She's a senior international correspondent at CNN. In 2020, Nema was named the Royal Television Society's Television Journalist of the Year, and in 2019 received the Alfred Dupont Columbia University Award in investigative category for reporting on human rights abuses across Africa. And Last but not least, we're joined by Tag el Kazin. He's a senior fellow at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. He's also a member of the Alternative Disputes Resolution Institute of Canada and the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, UK. So with that being said, I would like to, uh, each of our um, guests will have four to five minutes to make an opening statement about how they see this crisis in Ethiopia. And then we'll be followed by questions between the group and followed by that, we'll take questions in the last 15 minutes, take questions from the audience. So I'd like to pass the floor to you, Alan. Thank you, Kyle. I'm honored to share the platform with such distinguished colleagues, and I look forward to today's discussion. As Kyle mentioned, the situation in Tigray province is critical. In addition to what he mentioned about death and destruction, we know 1.7 million people have been displaced, 45,000 refugees have now fled to Sudan. We know that, um, the region faces what a UN official calls the worst famine in a decade, with 350,000 people facing starvation. The gross abuses of human rights are unimaginable, particularly the systematic sexual violence against women and girls, often committed openly by military in uniform. The destruction of infrastructure, schools and hospitals, the denial of humanitarian aid, attack on humanitarian workers, this carries all the hallmarks of ethnic cleansing. And indeed, four months ago, the U.S. State Department's internal report described it as just that, an attempt to produce a homogeneous society without Tigrayans. It's also been called ethnic cleansing by credible international organizations like uh, Amnesty International. And of course, the EU special envoy, Pekka Havisto, recalled on the weekend that last February, when he visited senior officials in Ethiopia, they talked about wiping out Tigrayans, every last one, so they wouldn't exist for a hundred years. A brief restatement of R2P. What's it all about? Well, the principles were unanimously adopted by UN member states 16 years ago, 2005. Simply provides that each sovereign state is responsible to protect its own population from mass murder, that the international community will support each state in that effort. But if a state neglects or refuses or is incapable of protecting its population 
from mass murder, then the international community will act through the Security Council in a timely and decisive manner, using, if necessary, Chapter 7 of the UN Charter to protect that population from such atrocities. Two threshold questions. First of all, it's never an issue whether R2P applies to a specific situation. R2P always applies. Each state is always responsible to protect its population. And second, as my friend Simon Adams, one of the world's experts on R2P with the Global Center in New York has said often, it's never a choice between invasion on the one hand and inaction on the other. There's always a multitude of things the international community can do to exert pressure on the government that's failing to protect. So the question in this case, as in all others, is that what does respect for the principles of R2P require of us in the circumstances of this case? A word about the Security Council. It's a disgrace. And where is the Secretary General? The moral leadership we're entitled to expect from the SG. It is nowhere. While death and abuse continue, the Council argues over whether Ethiopia should be on its agenda and what kind of a meeting to have to discuss it. Russia and China, of course, will stand in the way of any such discussion. But shamefully, the African members of the Security Council, the so-called A3, Niger, Kenya, and Tunisia, are complicit in a betrayal of their duty to the international community, afraid that their own abuses will be examined. They're allowing, they're allowing thousands to die. It is shameful. And they're joined in that by St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Why did these countries run for the Security Council if they weren't going to accept their responsibility? The Security Council should be imposing sanctions, an arms embargo, a no-fly zone. And the Secretary General should be actively engaged in bringing the parties to the temp uh, table and providing the leadership for which he was appointed. So we have to go outside the United Nations, like the U.S. did recently, having on the fringes of the G7 meeting a U.S.-EU high-level dialogue about what to do in Ethiopia. The African Union must become more active, and we must pressure the Union to do so. It has launched an independent investigation, better than the Human Rights Council, which has diluted its investigation with a partnership with Ethiopia, but member states must do what they can to support the AU in being more active diplomatically. UN member states should offer to assist the AU financially and with expertise in that investigation. The international community and UN member states should act in the absence of the Security Council, imposing their own sanctions, imposing their own penalties like denial of budgetary aid to the governments of Eritrea and Ethiopia, boycotting exports, no visas, no visits, no family or children here or anywhere, and just one more thing before I close. Since we're operating in a world effectively without a Security Council, we should look closely at two recent works. Rebecca Barber published a terrific study on the legal authority of the General Assembly to act on its own. Let's examine that and make the most of it. And secondly, Professor Jennifer Trahan has recently published a book questioning the legality of P5 vetoes in cases of mass atrocities. We should look at that as well. Now, of course, it's not just the P5 here. We've got the three African states as well standing in the way of effective responses. But member states of the UN should do what they can, everything they can, to assist in this crisis. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Alan. And we'll, we're going to dig deeper into some of the recommendations you made. And, and I think there's a lot there that, that we can act on. We're not passive bystanders. So we can do more. i now like to invite Mukesh Kapila um, to the floor. Um, Mukesh, if you could unmute yourself and we'll pass the floor to you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. And uh, I think uh, Alan has uh, given us an extremely cogent uh, status report on where we are at in relation to the Tigray uh, uh, crisis. So without repeating that, let me emphasize uh, three or four points to provoke later discussion of. Firstly, the ethnic cleansing has already happened. The only thing at issue here is not if it is ethnic cleansing or what we call it, but what is the total volume of cost and suffering 
that will have to be underborn before there is a resolution of some sort to this uh, crisis. The second thing I would uh, say is that uh, uh, while I have huge respect for responsibility to protect, I'm not aware of any successful cases of R2P protecting anybody or anything in a living memory, at least my living memory. And I speak from the experience of having presided over the circumstances in, uh, in the Darfur genocide when I was the UN uh, uh, head in, in Sudan and also being involved in Srebrenica and uh, uh, Rwanda where I was there during the 100 days of killings uh, and in other situations uh, where I've been subsequently in, in, in Cambodia. The number third point I would like to make is, if you look at history, no genocide or ethnic cleansing has ever been reversed except the use of force. So don't let's kid ourselves. This is not going to be somehow sorted out by exhortations or by threats of sanctions or whatever. It will require some uh, the, the implementation of force. Now, the only question is in the geopolitics that prevail now, where is that countervailing force going to come from? Will it come, will it be until the resistance in Tigray, the armed resistance in Tigray is successful in reversing what's going on? Or is it going to come through uh, something else? I don't know. I'm not condoning or promoting that uh, uh, violent solutions, but we have to be, it has, it is important that we do not give people a false sense of hope when that hope is not available. So I think we have to seriously look at how uh, force can be applied to stop the violence that is currently being, being meted out. My third point I'm going to say is that uh, there is a need to mobilize individual countries who might be able to take action within their own territories because of the broadening out of the concept of universal jurisdiction. Recently, Switzerland, uh, uh, where I spend a lot of my time, uh, actually prosecuted some Liberian uh, uh, warlords who committed atrocities. Switzerland has nothing, has nothing to do with Liberia. Uh, and this crime took place uh, somewhere far away. But they intervened because the crimes against humanity in one place are a crime against all humanity uh, everywhere, everywhere else. Fourthly, I would, like, I would like to say is that there are forces within Ethiopia. You know, Ethiopia, a nation of over 100 million people, has the usual distribution of uh, uh, good and bad people that there are in every society in the world. And somehow the progressive forces in Ethiopia, who are not of a genocidal mindset as opposed to that of the government, if the Tigrayans can make common cause with other oppressed people in Ethiopia, we might be seeing the beginnings of a solution as we did in Sudan. It, in Sudan, uh, Darfur was only overcome, well, it is still in the process of being overcome, when the Darfurians made common cause with the oppressed peoples in the other parts of, of, of Sudan who were also suffering from, from al Bashir. So let me conclude by saying that I don't think we can look to international panaceas as they currently exist, uh, whether it's RTP, whether it is uh, the Secretary General or the UN Security uh, Council. It will have to come with the alignment of new ideas new forces, new coalitions for, from both within the country and externally that I think we will, uh, we will see progress towards, I hope, uh, something positive coming out of this. Over. Thank you, Mukesh, for those um, um, somber analysis of what's happening and, and a realistic view of what it might take. And, and I think you're right. If you look at a lot of the cases uh, of, of genocides, um, it's usually military force that stops them. There's uh, you know, that, that's what history shows us. Um, I'd like to now pass to Nema and, and have her perspective as a journalist about what's taking place and explaining it to, to our audience, which are Canadians, but also people following from all around the world. Nema, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kyle. And um, 
Thank you uh, both Alan and Mukesh for well, you know, for words that were both angering and heartbreaking in equal measure. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm uh, I'm just I'm just a journalist. So we we say what we see, and what we have been seeing since uh, November last year was very much a not not only a, a methodical targeting of a people under the auspices of targeting a political group but uh, an attempt to keep that targeting up far from the eyes of the world. So when this law enforcement operation, as the government of Ethiopia called it, was launched at the beginning of November, the first week of November, ostensibly this was to respond to an attack on the Northern Command by the Tigray People's Liberation Front. It was uh, a, an impasse that had, been, uh, that had been at loggerheads for some time between the regional leaders, the TPLF and uh, Abiy Ahmed and his government, Abiy Ahmed, who was a part of the, the ruling coalition. He was, he was in government until 2018 when demonstrations swept the TPLF. Um, the TPLF were the senior partner in, that, in the coalition that ruled Ethiopia. So swept that coalition away and brought Abiy Ahmed into power. So these elections that are happening now today in Ethiopia boycotted by the main opposition group and, and at a time when many opposition leaders are arrested are the first time that Abiy Ahmed has gone to polls. But the sense at the time that the government was attempting to portray is that this was a conflict between the government and the TPLF. But very quickly, what we began hearing from Tigrayans crossing over into Sudan is that, the, that they were being targeted, that civilians were being targeted. And very quickly, what we were hearing was about the, the, the presence of Eritrean troops, which at the time were denied vociferously by Eritrea, um, only to be acknowledged in a letter from Eritrea's ambassador to the UN Security Council. What I think was immediately apparent, apparent to me and the team was the, if you have, and I'm from Sudan, so, um, and I know Mukesh and his work from, from the time we spent covering Darfur. If you have covered an ethnic cleansing, if you have covered um, which is what the, uh, the Secretary of State in the US says this is, there is a, a, a very, there's an, almost an intimacy to the violence. Intercommunal violence is, is cruel in ways that only people who know each other very, very well are able to be cruel. And the stories that were coming out about people being forced to lie next to the bodies of their loved ones, um, people not being allowed to bury their loved ones on consecrated ground in, in churchyards, for, for communities that are incredibly devout, that um, led many of them to believe that the souls of their loved ones were not at peace, could not find eternal rest. The, the, um, the use of, of rape as a weapon of war, just there is, all war is horrible, but there are intentional cruelties that are inflicted to exacerbate the wounds of war that only exist in these kinds of, of intercommunal um, cleansings. And we began to see that very early on, but the, there was no electricity, there was no internet, there was no phone network. It took about two months for our first investigation on the massacre at Meriam Dangalat to be able, I mean, March actually, so three months for us to really be able to, to get a sense of what was happening on the ground, two months after the massacre happened. So there was a methodical attempt to both, apologies, there was a methodical attempt to both hide from the world, but also to present to the world. Um, I have to just tell everyone that I'm in hotel quarantine, so I have very little control over all this noise that's happening around me, so apologies. There was an attempt to hide it from the world and also to portray it to the world as violence between two political groups. But what we now know from those we have spoken to is that from the beginning, civilians were the target. From the beginning, women were targeted for, them, for some of the most extraordinary and excruciating acts of sexual violence that I have reported on in my career. The heartbreak, I think, for many Tigrayans who speak to us is this sense that it is not just that the world doesn't know, because the world does know. It is that the world is unwilling to act, that the United Nations Security Council is overseeing an international, an intentional international paralysis. And so while I agree with Mukesh and Alan about 
how the world has failed. I do believe that comp you know, moments like this where we're speaking about this in a public sphere, the reporting that has happened, I do believe that it serves a purpose and that's definitely what we've heard from many Tigrayans, many people inside and outside of Tigray and many Ethiopians because there's also intercommunal violence spreading beyond Tigray, is that the acknowledgement publicly of what is being done to them allows them to understand that they that, that they are not being gaslit by the Ethiopian government, that the Ethiopian government at least has not succeeded in erasing the reality on the ground, not just from the eyes of the world, but also to them when they doubt whether this is really being done to them and their families, and is it being done intentionally? So there is something that the world has been able to do, whether it's journalists or experts or academics, and that is to at least send the message to Degrayans that this is real, to Ethiopians that this is real, this is happening, and this matters, whether or not our highest international institutions like the UN Security Council act or not, the world cannot say it did not know, because it does. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Nima, and, and for reminding us of why the media is so important that when our institutions don't function, uh, you remind the world what's happening and it, and it mobilizes civil society and, and concerned citizens to, to keep on putting pressure. I now would like to uh, pass the floor to Tag. Tag, the floor is yours. Thank you. I am a realist, so probably I will take uh, probably a little bit of a different tangent. Someone said diplomacy without the military is like an orchestra without the instruments, and how very true. And the late Swedish diplomat, Dag Hammarskjöld, said the UN was not created in order to bring us to heaven, but in order to save us from hell. That's how the UN works. That's how they work. They are not going to go out and save the Tigrayans. By the day, I'm getting convinced that the battle of Tigray is to be fought on their ancestral grounds in Tigray. They now control one third of the territory. Addis Ababa controls one third, and Eritrea controls one third. If Eritrea is kicked out or if they leave, the Tigray Defense Forces, very little is talked about the Tigray Defense Forces. They are between 100K to 125K. And they are fighting and they are winning some battles and they are losing some battles. So they, there is a military existence that we are not really fully aware of. Other than lip service and political correctness and meager humanitarian aid, I see little value coming out of the dubious body called the international community. Who, who are they really? Canada is not and will not be a, play, a, a player to reckon with. Their support or lack of it will not be of tangible value other than for humanitarian assistance. We are not a very power. We are not a very powerful player. If the G7 were to be formed today, Canada will not be one of them. The game changer, really, as I see it, is the Tigray Defense Forces. The eight point manifesto of the TPLF needs to be strongly circulated, studied, and advocated. There is a memorandum of understanding that has been signed between the political parties in Tigray, and they are fighting together. It is not only the TPLF. Those fighting on the ground are other political forces. A profile of those parties needs to be written and circulated so that we are aware of what, what, what are the forces that are at, at play on the ground. The right for self-determination. Only the right for self-determination. There is a difference between the right for self-determination and the process of self-determination, which can only happen after a political settlement needs to be decided and advocated by the Tigrayans. A factual pro profile of the TDF needs to be drafted and circulated. Are they freedom fighters? Are they a resistance body? Who are the TDF? This is going to be a long drawn battle. With what I see, it is not going to end in tapping the shoulder that say, you know, let bygones be bygones. The Tigrayans are not going to accept that. And this battle is not going to be fought in Geneva or in New York. The diaspora need to work with the TDF to reopen the Eastern corridors. This was the biggest blow 
that the TDF and the uh, uh, TPVLF actually got is that the eastern corridors where supplies were coming from, for some reason, have been closed. They need to contact Sudan and Egypt. What cooperation can actually be there? If there is a will, there is a way. When Namibia wanted its independence, South Africa left a functioning country. So the SWAPO, South African People's Organization, they had their guerrilla weapons that they wanted to sell for $25 billion. At that time, uh, John Rawlings, Jerry Rawlings of Ghana paid $5 million and Roland uh, and, Lo and Tiny Roland of Londro paid $5 million and the SPLA of South Sudan got the whole whole moved to, to, to Maban in the presence of 40,000 of the army of Bashir in South Sudan. So the issue of supplies is not a big thing. Tigrayans must think outside the box and fight for their land. Nobody's going to fight for them. Where is Adwa? And how far back is 1896? Thank you. Thank you, Tag, for those comments. Um, they were, uh, I mean, fascinating, and but also um, makes us ponder about what we can we can or can't do as Canadians, but also people around the world. Um, so I would like to go into questions now uh, directed to each panelist, and I'd like to start with Alan. Um, 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 Alan, and this touches a bit with Tags it because he said that you know that Canada won't be a major player, but I but still going here, I, I'd, I'd like to know that. You know, you mentioned that we haven't seen a lot of action regarding uh, the case in Ethiopia from the UN Security Council. And I'm wondering what mechanisms are available to the Canadian government to hold the perpetrators responsible? Um, could you talk about this from the high level view of being Canada's ambassador to the UN? Well, sure. And, and to begin with, I think I will refer to the principles of responsibility to protect. I'm disappointed and troubled by uh, Mukesh's characterization of R2P as worthless. Um, the fact that it relies for any implementation on a security council that's functioning may explain why it has not been uh, as effective as it should have been over the last 15 years. But the problem isn't with the principles of our 2 p it's with the council. And in any event, there have been successes. Kofi Annan attributes his success in 2008 in Kenya to avoiding conflict there, internal conflict following the disputed elections to our 2 p which he specifically invoked. Cote d'Ivoire and elsewhere, there have been real successes. But put that aside for the moment, um, I also am worried by the suggestion that it's only force that's going to resolve this. Surely that's not the way we should approach international challenges. We can do better than that. And I think concerted, creative, committed diplomacy conducted by the appropriate partners can make the progress we need to see. An invasion is not, I don't think, is going to be in the cards. The Security Council is never going to authorize it. And apart from that, it's illegal. So I, I, I just don't see that. What can Canada do? Well, Ethiopia is one of the largest recipients of Canadian bilateral international development assistance. Let's take a look at that. Let's see what kind of budgetary support we're providing for Prime Minister uh, Abi and and how that can be pared down to penalize him and put pressure on him. And if countries around the world do the same, and the EU has already started, I think we may be able to see some, some influence. I think we should also invoke the Magnitsky Act. It's our own domestic legislation, providing that we can impose sanctions and penalties against individual abuses of human rights. You know, a lot of these people in the military in Eritrea and in Ethiopia like, they're send, like to send their kids to Canada or elsewhere for university. Well, let's cut that off. Let's seize any assets they have here in Canada secreted away. Let's, uh, let's take other steps under Magnitsky to impose sanctions. Let's boycott exports uh, of e e Ethiopia and Eritrea. Let's engage in shunning. Let's discourage tourism to those countries. And let's support the African Union investigation which is independent and uh, provide them with any help they need in terms of forensics or otherwise. So I think there are many things we can do uh, short of military force. If we do it in an organized collective way internationally, it can have an impact. And that's why the absence of the secretary general uh, as the conductor of the orchestra 
is so damaging. Who's going to pull this together and coordinate it? Of course, Canada is not a major nuclear power, but we have a lot of influence when we deploy our excellent diplomacy creatively and intelligently, and let's do it. Thank you, Alan, for outlining um, all these new policies that have been put in place, Magnitsky sanctions and others, to try to influence behavior of certain individuals in government who are responsible for human rights abuses. I would now like to turn to, to Mukesh. Um, Mukesh, what have we learned about the UN system from stopping the Darfur genocide that can be applied to, to Tigray? Um, is there anything that, that you think, I, kn I know you were, you were critical, but is there anything from that that we can, we can learn from your experience that, that we haven't done in this case? Well, I think uh, I've said it uh, really, the uh, UN Security Council didn't stop the, the Darfur uh, genocide as such. What happened, well, it did in that uh, the Security Council met and they referred the matter to the International Criminal, Criminal Court. But the, by the time that happened, the genocide was complete. I mean, you have to get it into your heads that all these in international instruments, by the time you build up the evidence and by the time you apply anything, the job is done. And that's why I, I think it's very important that I react to Alan. So I didn't say the R2P is, uh, is uh, nothing. I was very much involved in its original foundation and I funded it, its setup. At that time, I was in the British government. My point is that uh, that uh, R2P, unfortunately, because it requires member states and Security Council, and when these people don't want to act, obviously it's useless. And you cannot, you cannot, I respectfully submit that you cannot equate the internal problems of Kenya at one stage in its history with the existentialist genocidal threat of the elimination of a people in, in, in Tigray. They are like saying that the instrument of R2P can be applied on one hand to a little domestic disturbance, on the other hand to what is like a, like a, like a modern, um, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word Holocaust, but a modern genocide. It's impossible, it's impossible. Finally, if the Security Council is not there and the Secretary General is absent, then what is the point of invoking R2P? Why do you march people up the hill, give them all this nonsense hope, and then leave them? Now, I'm not, I, I do not believe in uh, invoking uh, violence. Uh, I was the chair of Nonviolent Peace Force, which is, was the biggest uh, NGO in the world, dealing with uh, uh, unarmed civilian uh, peacekeeping and other non-violent peace uh, uh, ways of working. But let me tell you one thing. There is international law that says that when a people are faced with an existentialist threat to their own survival, they have every right in the world to defend uh, themselves. Did you say this to the Jews when they were uh, sitting in the middle of the Holocaust saying, oh, guys, uh, it's very sorry. Uh, you, you know, just stand there and suffer it. See, it was armed resistance that solved these things. It was in the end Vietnam that stopped uh, 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 Cambodia. It was Kagame coming back with, with, his, with his army that stopped the Rwanda genocide. So let's not have any liberal lectures, uh, you know, sitting in New York or uh, Montreal or Toronto or, uh, or Ottawa or London for that matter, or Geneva on this particular issue. I think it is important that the people of Tigray, if we cannot protect them by any tools at our disposal, and this has to be done in real time, not a Security Council resolution six months from now when, uh, when somehow you applied enough leverage on China to reverse its position and somehow someone has uh, kind of given some balls to the Secretary General uh, who lost his long time ago. <laughs> that does no good to the people who are being raped, dying in industrial numbers now. This is not a diplomatic game being played out, out, out there to some theorists, if you like. I'm sorry, but I think you are wrong. You're out of order. Sanctions are not going to help to do this, nor will other measures, because in the end, when a genocidal mindset is active, they're not amenable to diplomacy. This is why you go to war, because if you're amenable to diplomacy, then you are the sort of person who's not going to commit genocide in the first place, unless you're denying there is no ethnic cleansing or no, no genocide. And Nima's evidence and others' evidence would, would seem to belie that. So I would say we have to bolster the morale and the resistance part of the Tigrayan uh, people. It is not for me to, to say an armed intervention. And by the way, we're not good at armed intervention. Look at Afghanistan uh, and look at many other places. I'm not in favor of that. But I'm also not in favor 
of saying, oh, by the guys, sit there, uh, you know, uh, in your little committee rooms, uh, you know, lobby in the informal Security Council uh, meetings and uh, put pressure on this, that or other country and uh, uh, do intellectual work on evolution of the law. And then this will be over. That is nonsense. It's insulting to the people of Tigray and it is killing people, even as the silence of many people kills uh, the people there. Mukesh, thank you for your strong comments. And to bring one point together, Alan, and yours, I, I think there's a common point is that the Secretary General is absent and, and that's something that we we need to, to focus on. I would now like to um, ask a question to, to Nema. Um, and really as your role as a journalist, uh, what are the challenges in covering uh, the situation in Tigray and how difficult is it and how can reporters overcome them? So I think the challenge that we have is very similar to the challenge that uh, aid workers and people in the humanitarian community have in Tigray at the moment, which is the vast chasm between the, the perceptions of access, the claims that the government has made of giving access and the realities of access on the ground. So um, they have given visas. Uh, we have a CNN team on the ground today reporting on the elections. They have given visas to other news organizations. But this access is then buttressed by um, lectures and um, very politely uh, expressed uh, do's and don'ts and red lines. And then when you get on the ground, as, as, as we showed in, our, in, in the piece that we did when we were in Tigray, you then have to deal with the reality of the, you know, the soldiers on the ground blocking the, the same roads that we were trying to take. They were also blocking them for the humanitarian community. So the, the Ethiopian government says it gives access to both journalists and aid workers, but the, the, horrif the horrifying numbers that Sir Mark Lowcock, the former UN aid chief, he's recently stepped down, was talking about 350,000 people in famine conditions. That does not speak to true access. And similarly, with us, I mean, I would say optimistically that we maybe know 40%, and by we, I mean as journalists, and therefore we as the world, maybe know 40% of what is happening there. You know, every day um, I wake up, I check my phone, and there are messages. There are messages from people inside Tigray, there are messages from contacts and sources, and every morning it's a process of filtering through what can we verify, what can we investigate, and the messages are heartbreaking, but it's uh, sometimes it's because a lot of these people, they themselves are searching for information. They themselves are, are striving to discover whether their loved ones are alive or dead. And I think it's really awful. It's a real indictment of the international system that, that we as journalists are the closest that these people are getting to answers. That for me is, I think, one of the most difficult things. There was a, a, a story that we reported on about two weeks ago where hundreds of Tigrayan men were detained in Shiri. They were taken away by Ethiopians and Eritreans. They were tortured in what was a, a horribly was a, an aid distribution facility that had been taken over by the soldiers. And we were able to geolocate using the, the descriptions that we received. We were able to geolocate the facility and we were lucky enough that the satellite images that we took that were taken for us by Maxar showed all these this this crowd this throng of people at the facility and um, we were able to get it raised by Chris Coons at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee the UN spoke out of, about it and they were released and that's wonderful but it's really embarrassing that we should have been the ones to ring the alarm bells that's it's not my job. Um, in a fully functioning system, it shouldn't be our job to ring those alarm bells. We shouldn't be the first port of call for people desperate to find out whether their, their loved ones who are being tortured are going to come back alive. So we come back again to this indictment, I think, of the international system. And, and, and just off the back of Mukesh and Allen, I do think it's kind of my job to give people a little bit of hope in the sense that what we have seen and in Darfur and elsewhere is even the most intransigent of international actors and whether those actors are in the Security Council or those actors are inside Ethiopia, they are vulnerable to international pressure. So you, Kyle, have asked, what can Canadians do? Make a fuss. Make sure that your, your prime minister and your representatives and your media outlets know that this is a story that you care about, that you care about those people and what's being done to them. And I think we will see 
as we saw in other situations where there are these outcries and this uh, deluge of public opinion, I think you will see that no matter who you are, it is very difficult to set your face against the storm of a unified human voice saying enough. Thank you, Nema. Um, I agree with you and, and I, I think it's fascinating for you to talk about you know, using um, open source information and geolocation. I know Bellingcat did a report on execution of, of people and it really caused a response and the Eritrean embassies around the world had to respond to it. So we do know that they're careful and are trying to, to counter some of the narratives coming out from investigations from the media and from NGOs. I would like to, to pass the floor to, or ask a question to, to Tag now, because we've talked a lot about, about, um, about Ethiopia, but what is, what is Eritrea's role in this? And, and what is their interest? That's not clear to a lot of people. We think it's only an Ethiopian issue, but there's, it's also neighboring states involved. And could you maybe explain this and help us understand what's happening? Otag, you're on. You need to unmute yourself, yeah, please. Yeah, there is a legacy issue. There is a deep-rooted uh, legacy issue. I, when I was still in Sudan, and for a very long time, I, I had a transport company, and I was transporting all the gear that comes to the Eritrean Revolution movements to Garora. And I must confess that it was the Eritreans who actually taught the TPLF at that time how to fight Mangisto. So we used to transport the share of the Ethiopian resistance to a place called Jebel Ghana by Kadarif. So there is a long uh, history that goes, a uh, long good history that goes between them. The second thing is the issue of Badme did not really end by the ruling uh, of the International Tribunal in The Hague. And it was the TPLA for a long time that pressured not to hand back that Badme and the related areas that were given back to Eritrea in that ruling to uh, Asmara. So that was the grudge that has been there for a long time. Even after Abi Ahmed, I think it was 2018, uh, when he went to uh, Eritrea and he said, yeah, well, I accept the ruling now and you can take back me back. It was the TPLF and, and the Tigray that kept on uh, the hold on, uh, on Badmi. Badmi is a worthless piece of, I was there several times and if they give it to you with a million dollars, there is no reason for you to take it. The other reason is that there were 100,000 refugees from Eritrea a very repressive regime. I was there several times as a consultant. The last time, I think it was 2014, 2015. A very repressive regime. So there were 100,000 refugees in camps in Tigray. God knows what happens to those. So the Eritreans, for them, that was, that was the real bait. They wanted to have access demolish, take back, execute, imprison whoever they wanted if they can defeat uh, 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 the TPLF. And for Abi Ahmed and his military in Addis Ababa to control militarily, to control Tigray very quickly, they had to come from different uh, sides. They actually went to Sudan and they lured Sudan into blocking the Tigrayans having supplies or fleeing through the Sudan. And then they made this deal with Eritrea that, you know, this is your opportunity to get the 100K uh, refugees. This is your opportunity to get back uh, Badme. However, we would like you to start bombarding and fighting the TPLF from the north. There was no access for the Ethiopian forces to come from the north. And that was clear when Abi Ahmed put on a bomber jacket, when he actually commanded the air force and he sent the drones that were supplied by the Emirates to bombard Tigray. So there is a long legacy. There are also vendettas between uh, uh, Isaiah Saforgi and Melezinawi. Melezinawi is, uh, is, is Tigray. 
Isaiah 40 is Tigray on the other side. So it is that it is that uh, legacy, and there was that bait and interest of uh, of Eritrea to come into the war. Thank you. Thank you, Jag. So everyone, we have about fifteen minutes, um, about fifteen minutes left. So um, I'd like to ask people following this online on YouTube, Facebook, or on Twitter to pose a question if it's specific towards someone. We have fifteen minutes to take those questions. Uh, one has come in, and and it's directed towards Mukesh. But if anyone feels they would like to comment on this, they're Kyle. welcome. Kyle, yes. just before we get to that, can I say a word about uh, Bukesh's last intervention just very quickly? Sure, because yes. He, he mounted a very aggressive attack on an argument that was not made. Of course, the Grayans can defend themselves militarily. There's no question about that. What I was saying is that international attacks, using the military to invade, is not the answer, either legally or practically. Nor do I argue that the problem should be left to be resolved by faceless bureaucrats in airless rooms in the basement of the UN building. I'm talking about active, hands-on, creative, committed diplomacy. I'm with Nima, who says that no matter who you are, eBay or anybody else, you, can know, you cannot long withstand a world in which everyone is pointing the finger at you and shunning you and saying, this must stop. So candidates should be part of motivating and galvanizing that global response, not invading the country, but putting such pressure on the government of Ethiopia and Eritrea that we can influence their conduct, not six months from now, today. That's the argument I'm making. Sorry, Cal, I just had to get that off. No, 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 no problem. I, these are these are heated debates, and, and no one has the perfect answer about what should be done or can be done, and, and who will act on it. So uh, we're we're open to have these these hard policy discussions to try to help people think about this. Uh, Mukesh, a question coming in for you that that um, if you feel comfortable answering it, um, please let me know. Um, let me find it right here. Um, yeah, it's basically asking, based on your experience in Darfur, would you label the the crimes, war crimes, ethnic cleansing in Tigray as genocide? Yes, absolutely no doubt about that. The pattern of the violence that is taking place in uh, Tigray uh, uh, meets all the criteria that are laid out in the convention. And it is not just experience of Darfur. I've seen the same pattern, for example, when I was in Trebunitsa, and even more so when I was in, uh, in Rwanda. So to me, this is uh, very, very clear. And this is now said not just by me, but by also several parliaments. And this raises the issue that the determination of genocide, it, there's nowhere in the convention that says that, it, that a determination of genocide can only be made uh, you know, by an international court. Ideally, yes, but can also be made in, in other fora. And while I've got to, uh, the floor, I'm glad, Alan, that we clarified that. Uh, you know, I certainly was, uh, uh, I, I, I agree with you. But at the same time, let me also say that I'm not advocating external military uh, intervention. We know good. That, 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 that we know the harm that that has done in many other, uh, many, uh, other places. All I'm reacting to is, is that don't flog a dead horse. I do not think anything is going to come out of this Secretary General, this Security Council, and I do not think anything is going to uh, come out of the current generation of diplomats, however good they might be. And the G7 that everyone had uh, hopes on, including your Prime Minister who was also sitting in beautiful uh, Cornwall, what did it produce? It pr produced a damp squib. Okay, can everyone, I seem to have, people have been disconnected. Can people hear me, yes? Yes. Yep. Okay, so we apologies, I, I, I think I got a bad Wi-Fi connection. So uh, there's a question coming in for uh, for you, Nema. It says, Prime Minister um, Abiy uh, Ahmed has finally acknowledged that there is sexual violence occurring in, in Tigray, and the region is on the brink of famine. Given your experience reporting on human rights abuses, how do you report on these these complicated topics? Oh wow! Okay, uh, an existential question. Um, uh, I think what we, uh, you know, as I was, you know, as I was describing earlier, you 
with experience comes um, a sense for the rhythms of these things, you know, there are the, the methodology, the way that it changes. So when we reported very early on, on the rapes and the use of rape as a weapon of war, and it was denied by the Ethiopian government, we felt very comfortable that this methodology was methodology that we had seen used before the patterns of behavior match the patterns of behavior that we had seen in other crises we had covered. But more importantly, I think also what we do and, and uh, the work that we do investigatively is, is incredibly time consuming and difficult and complicated, let alone in a situation like this where the connectivity is an issue, people are afraid, you have a moral responsibility to try and protect the people who speak to you. With What we do is we speak to as many people from outside of that initial vantage point as possible. So with the massacre in Meriam Dengalad, I think it was three or four different vantage points, three or four different families and, and groupings and different perspectives. And so you end up ultimately ho hoping that these different accounts can be kind of laid, you know, like a lattice work of testimony to allow you to see where the stories don't match up or perhaps where this which is not what happened in that case but where it is clear that there you know why does why does that perspective on it differ from this if they were standing in this place why does that def, uh, pers perspective differ so much from what we'd expect from that place so i think that's one of the things that is quite helpful the other thing and and carl you mentioned um the massacre at mahabra dega which we uh, also worked on with amnesty with that, the open source investigations have been really incredibly helpful. But we come back again to this human testimony, eyewitness accounts. Every time we think we've reinvented the wheel as journalists, actually, we, we find out that we still need that, that when all else fails, when they shut things down, when the, the sky, the cloud cover means that the satellite can't get you decent images or decent resolution of where this happened, human testimony and and people risking their lives incredibly bravely because what we have seen again and again is that, uh, Carl, you mentioned this, that they are watching, the Ethiopian and Eritrean governments are watching how they're being portrayed to the world. And that often after, whether it's our reporting or the media reporting, they go back into these places. After our report on Tigray, they went into the Aksum teaching hospital where we had spoken to doctors and they demanded a list of the people we'd spoken to. And we, we had to go on air and say, this is this is unacceptable. We had to flag it at the highest possible levels. And we raised it with the Ethiopian prime minister's office. It's, it's a very difficult line that we are continuously treading between our responsibility to the people who speak to us, but people's own desire to express their agency. One of the most heartbreaking things I think I have been told consistently by the, by people we have spoken to in today is there is a chance that I'm going to die anyway. There is a chance, a very big chance that uh, that I'm going to lose loved ones. And so I would rather try and make sure that somewhere there is an account of what has been done to us. And that that extraordinary sense of of communal commitment to this story being memorialized has just I think humbled all of us again and again. Thank you, Nema. Um, one question coming in, I'm not sure who uh, is the best position to answer this question. So please uh, raise your hand or, or just uh, unmute yourself and if you feel like, um, like jumping on it. But someone says, what is the role of the African Union in dealing with this, given that the African Union is headquartered in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and has a constitution which is very strong, even stronger than the response to protect in calling for intervention when there are mass atrocity crimes. Can I speak briefly to that? I think the role of the African Union is absolutely critical. It's a regional organization closest on the ground as a political operation to the countries in question. As you point out, its own constitution provides an even stronger formula than R2P. That R2P in its development was much influenced by the African Union's leadership on the question of collectively stepping in to stop genocide or ethnic cleansing. And, and furthermore, they've already shown independence by refusing to have Ethiopia join their investigation. They're having an AU investigation independent of Ethiopia, looking into the facts, and they've given it three months to, to report. And hopefully that evidence will be used in eventual prosecutions. 
But the African Union has an essential role to play, and that's why I think that countries like Canada can urge the AU to be more vigorous in its diplomacy. We can work with them. We can offer them partnerships, not just Canada, but countries around the world. And I think that's that's important. Interesting, Mukesh says that he thinks a genocide's going on. The Genocide Convention imposes a legal obligation on all member states to prevent genocide. That means Canada, Kenya, all the countries in the world have an obligation, a legal obligation, to prevent genocide in Ethiopia. So let's roll up our sleeves. Thanks, Alan. Oh, I please, uh, please yeah, I, I your, your turn. Say, just to piggyback off Alan's point about the African Union carrying out its own independent investigation and not allowing the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission or the Ethiopia to be a party to that investigation, it's important to point out that that's more than the United States has asked for. So the United States at the moment, the mechanism that they back is the joint United Nations Human Rights Commission and Ethiopian Human Rights Commission investigation. The Ethiopian Human Rights Commission is a state appointed body. And although they have come out with um, with statements about what is happening in Tigray, there is a reality about how how can you balance being a state appointed body in the climate that we're talking about, where the allegation is that the state has, is responsible uh, for masterminding or at least creating the environment in which these crimes could happen and then have them part of a credible uh, joint international investigation. So I think that's a very important point to make with regards to the African Union's involvement. The second important point though, unfortunately to make is that the African Union suffers from a huge credibility problem. The African Union time and time again has um, very has had member states putting forward their personal interests, their personal um, um, issues and 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 competitions and, and 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 national snipings over and above the realities of what their constitution may say. So, with regards to the African Union, you have Ethiopia on one hand, you have Sudan and Egypt on the other who are very concerned about the, the, the Great Dam project in Ethiopia and potentially the impact that it's going to have. Most environmentalists believe the impact will be largely on Sudan, but, it, but Egypt is, is incredibly um, exercised about this dam, about the filling of the dam, about whether the second filling of the dam that's, um, that's due in July should be seen as an act of war. So how does the African Union balance these competing interests between a country with the second largest population in Africa, a regional superpower, Egypt, which is in extraordinarily powerful both in Africa and in the Middle East, and Sudan, which is also very regionally powerful. Uh, but also beyond that, the African Union waited too long to launch its investigation with regards to the way that many people view its credibility on this. We are now, I mean, this started in November, we're, we're knocking on the door of July. People have huge concerns about that. I think often, I, I say this both as a journalist, but also as an African, I think often from an international perspective, there is um, a reticence to criticize the African Union or criticize other regional bodies, rightly because of the, the legacy of colonialism and imperialism. And those are very important legacies to bear in mind. But when the people inside the context, whether it's in Ethiopia or in other countries where the African Union has been charged by the international community of being the main body that carries out some form of resolution. When the people within the context say that we are not sure that this body has the credibility that it needs to have, I think it's very important for the international community to listen to that. Thank you, Nema. We've come you, to- you know, you know, Kyle, I don't think we should leave this uh, process without having a couple of words about the prospects for a political settlement because this is where the end game is people can continue fighting there is no conflict that rages forever either there is a winner or a loser or there is a political settlement do you want me just to touch very quickly on that please you have two minutes and then we'll have to close the event but please tag the floor is yours sure thank you very much uh uh, this, this was actually one of your uh, questions in, in, in the paper. The first thing we need to do is really to separate the humanitarian envelope from the political envelope. Otherwise, the Tigrayans will be lending themselves to what I call emotional and sentimental blackmail. And this is what happened in the case of South Sudan. The very Traxler agreement dealt with the humanitarian envelope. That's why during the political 
uh, discussions in, in, in Kenya, nobody was talking about rape or killing or maiming or whatever have you. That was a completely different uh, envelope. And then we have got to have players that can put up the, the carrot and, and the stick, and they have got to be balanced. There has got to be a strong group of international friends of a process, and the process has got to have a process design. We need to ascertain the political will of both parties. The fighting is going to continue. Uh, they are not ready now. There is no political will right now. And then Adi Sababa, as a precondition, has got to declassify the TPLF as, as a terrorist organization. Otherwise, they will not sit and talk to them. They need to agree cessation of hostilities, not only ceasefire, but other hostilities as well. Negotiate a declaration of principles. What are the issues? And then we need to prioritize the files. When you have got competence, then the security arrangements come at the top of, uh, of, of the negotiations. So there is, as until now, there is lack of political will from heavyweights to actually form a venue, appoint the mediation uh, body, and bring the people to the table. So we are very far from a political settlement. And I suggest that we need to start with that. We need to bear in mind that even if there is an agreement, there has got to be a kind of new deal of the G7 plus or a kind of multi-donor trust fund so that there are targeted interventions to rebuild Tigray as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, just uh, want to thank you. We could continue the discussion uh, for a long time, but our speakers have, have agreed to join us just for one hour. We'll be posting this video online. I don't want to take the, the chance on behalf of my colleagues at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Rights Studies to thank Alan, Nema, Mukesh, and Kai for joining us. Um, all of your expertise we're going to take back and, and, and try to get more Canadians to engage in this issue. So thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Well done. Thank, thank you, you so everybody. Much. Thank you yeah, very much. Thank Great. You.